It's uh, my great pleasure. Uh, I, I'm Christopher Coots. I'm a professor of law in the Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program here and a proud member of the Tanner Committee, which has achieved, I think, a three-day record of an uh, enthusiastic crowd for these events. Uh, the committee, of course, takes uh, some credit for our brilliant selection of uh, speaker and commentators who've uh, drawn you all here. And um, thank you all for coming and coming back. Um, <laughs> This, you, you wonderfully patient audience, this will, today will be your chance to ask questions, uh, but first, <laughs> um, well, let me tell you what's going to happen. Um, so uh, we, uh, all four of our commentators uh, have something more to say uh, about, uh, about the lectures. Um, we're going to go in the order of the original commentators. You'll hear first from Adam Gopnik, next from Roshana Kamtakar, then from Chris Korsgaard, zooming in from outer space, and then back to Berkeley, Alexander Nahamas. Uh, we'll give some comments, and then we're going to take a quick break, um, uh, and you know, facilities are over there, um, and uh, uh, Rachel will give a quick response to those comments, and then it's all yours. I'll recognize speakers at that point, recognize questioners. We'll move a mic around, um, but it becomes uh, an open session at that point. So hang on there. There's some great commentary coming, and then uh, great Q&A. So Adam, uh, Adam Gopnik, I'm not going to. I'm going to dispense with all introductions. You've heard them beautifully introduced by my colleagues already. But Adam, please uh, take it away. Well, you've, been, you've been stuck with us for the past three days, so you're having some kind of Berkeley version of Stockholm syndrome. You have to be convinced <laughs> that we are worth listening to. Um, uh, I will begin with a with a theatrical uh, display of craft. In my usual craft, as a as a storyteller in the one man show, I give or in the cabarets and concerts I write, it is the fundamental rule of presentation that you must never look at a written text. It's to look at a written text for a second is an unforgivable sin if you're doing, I did a storytelling show at the public theater and if my eyes were seen to dart towards a, a, a cheat sheet anywhere, my director would come out and yell at me and the audience wouldn't actually boo but they'd be dissatisfied. And uh, I have I write often uh, cabarets and concerts for a wonderful jazz singer, and there again we hide every piece of writing someplace in the room so her eyes seem only to be glancing around at her her delighted audience, and they don't see that she's reading the lyric of "Not Getting Married Today" well, from the the back window. But I have noticed here that part of the the craft of um, the philosophical lecture is to look directly at your words. <laughs> As you, as you carry on, or at least to feel free to consult it. So um, in tribute to the craft of my <laughs> colleagues, I am going to look at the some, at notes and, and arguments that I was writing listening to the brilliant talk uh, yesterday. Um, one of our commentators uh, said yesterday, um, rather sweetly and appreciatively, that she thought that the movies were a wonderful, powerful model of craft, exactly because there were all of these wonderful um, mini crafts, significant crafts going on, all under the benevolent direction of a director, um, which to anyone who's actually worked in the movies puts something of a smile on your face because it's actually more like a competitive war between principalities with a, a single figure struggling desperately to bring some kind of order to that chaos. But one of the words, one of the phrases that you hear very often in the business of entertainment and making movies is um, about stakes. What are the stakes in something? Can you keep the stakes up? And in fact, that's turned into the word stakesy now. So you'll often find yourself in a, in a consultation when you're pitching a, a show or a musical or a play, and they'll say, mm, doesn't seem to me sort of sufficiently stakesy. Or <laughs> if you isolate your hero or heroine out on an island where they have absolutely no recourse to human hope or help, now that's stakesy. So I wanted quickly today to make our conversation stakesy in a certain way, or at least to ask what, for those of us who are not professional philosophers, the stakes of the, uh, the back and forth we've been hearing really are for a contemporary audience. And I say that with enormous appreciation of all the things that uh, philosophers are fascinated by, the path from Techne to, Telio, to Telos is inherently interesting. But I wanted to ask just what is the value for those of us uh, in the contemporary world. And it seemed to me, when I was thinking about it and listening yesterday, that it's rooted in an ongoing argument about art and craft. That is one of the distinguishing kinds of uh, DNA spirals of what it is to be modern. Um, exactly because beginning in the middle of the 19th century especially, it became apparent that craft was being discounted 
in a modern industrialized society. And yet craft carried within it a reservoir of values that would never be replicated by alienated labor. And that, it seems to me, is the historical dilemma on which the contemporary version of this argument and this concern rests. Those are the stakes, if you like, that are engaged when we, when we, when we listen. Um, the idea for a very long time was that craft would come to the rescue of art. And uh, uh, we heard beautifully yesterday about the role of someone like William Morris in making that case. And now Morris is still, I think, quite correctly discounted as a thinker exactly because he was so superior as a, as a fabric maker and as a decorator, in, in, as an interior decorator, to use the, the awkward but accurate label. And that idea that craft would come to the rescue of art was a very powerful one uh, throughout in Britain, but throughout Europe and in America in the 19th century. Uh, it turned not just on the revival of lost crafts like book binding and illuminating manuscripts, but even on the Ruskinian taste, which we also uh, heard about yesterday, for detail, the maniacal intensity of particularization uh, that is the signature of pre-Raphaelite painting. Uh, it's in itself deliberately craftsmanlike. It emphasizes the probity of the painter's brush against the romantic sublimity of the painter's vision. Um, so that even when we're not dealing directly with handmade things, when it's not macrame or an embroidered vest, nonetheless, that role of craft is central to the beginnings of uh, anti-modernity, the reaction against modernity in 19th century painting. Now, one of the things that strikes, strikes me and I was thinking about is that craft is very easy, therefore, to sentimentalize. Um, and very because we, uh, we ascribe it, all of the ideals of the lost, archaic, pre-industrial civilizations that we admire, when we actually try to become craftsmen in modernity, it almost always ends in some kind of comedy. Um, it, that was particularly true, of course, about Ruskin himself when he invented the Guild of St. Luke, which managed, if I remember correctly, to make one uh, dry, um, uh, dusty road somewhere, and then they all quit and went back to London. They couldn't sustain that vision. And of course, in William Morris, part of the, I wrote a, an essay about Morris once, and one of the things that makes him lovable is the space between all of the idealized erotic relationships in his writing and the actual human mess of his love life and uh, with Jane and with the rest of the pre-Raphaelite circle. Um, I say that not to minimize their accomplishment, but simply to remind us that it is easy to, to idealize and sentimentalize craft, and that part of the story of craft in modernity has been exactly the comedy of the distance between our aspirations for craft and our actual capacity to realize it in the world. Um, and yet, that still seems to me, as I said in my first remarks the, the other day when I wasn't looking at a screen, um, that uh, that essentially dynamic, unending, circular, spiraling, real-like relationship between art and craft has been one of the distinguishing features of modern art, particularly, but of moder modernity itself more broadly. Uh, each moment uh, when an art seems to have become a craft, or as we like to say, merely a craft, it has to be rescued by exactly those parts of the art-making experience that are indeed unplanned, discovered in the course of making that are, in a certain sense, accidental or have an element of awkwardness or chance. Um, then, with something having become an art, uh, it can easily become a craft again. That's part of the history of, of modernism is, for instance, Picasso and Brock invent cubism, which is an extraordinary uh, assault on the craft, the conventionalized craft of realist painting. And then it becomes, in the hands of the academic cubists, it becomes a formula, a, a mechanism, uh, a craft of that, of that kind. The same thing happens with abstract expressionists and the so-called A Street painters. Um, so that uh, this, instead of having some, a neat ongoing division between the aspirations of art and the uh, achievements of craft, we find this constant spiraling back and forth, and including the way in which what we might call craft objects, handmade objects, then inspire art. One of my favorite examples has always been that the, the furniture of Rietveld precedes the abstractions of Mondrian. It's not that the geometric and uh, red, white, and blue abstractions of Mondrian then produce a popular style. It's that the craft comes first and the art comes after. Um, and again and again, we see that um, uh, as uh, art begins to become an, 
a replicable craft, something exactly that has the quality that we know what we want to produce when we begin to produce it. It's exactly at tho those moments that something has to re-enter the cycle, has to re-enter, be reintroduced into the system that is clearly uh, either not craft or comes from a craft that's so far removed from our conventional notions of art that it has some of the blinding presence of an epiphany. I think immediately of pop art, of course, where the thing that was the craft, and it was a very evolved craft of um, comic book cartooning, uh, got reintroduced uh, willy-nilly into what had previously been the sacrosanct uh, realm of art. So there again, we didn't always recognize it as craft, and part of the archaeology of the art history of pop art has been to understand the skills of the craftsmen who made the comic books that Roy Lichtenstein, among others, then uh, imitated and uh, reused and edited. Uh, none of this, I mean to say, is bad or good. I just want to draw our attention to the way in which this is a stakesy's a stakesy conversation, exactly because that relationship between art and craft is so not just accessory to, but in many ways defining of uh, our modernity. But there is, I think, a second sense of craft which has come up again and again in these brilliant lectures, and that's the simple sense of craft, meaning not the thing that is in constant conversation with art, the thing that we long for as part of an organic society that we no longer uh, can participate in wholly. There's a second sense of craft, meaning merely well-made things, well-made things, and our ability to discriminate between well-made things and ill-made things. And that seems part of our normativity, as, as a word I've learned to use in the last three days, um, <laughs> Uh, of the normativity of our life as critics and spectators of uh, the modern circus. We like artisanal things. Uh, and even though that has, to some degree, become the cliche of craft, our liking for the artisanal, so you cannot go to any uh, farmer's market in, in America without everything being described as artisanal, not just cheese and ale, but peaches and nectarines are artisanal. Hard to understand in what sense they are artisanal, but we accept that that's a high uh, kind of praise. Um, but there are other things, too, that, again, participate in the spiral of, uh, not just the spiral of art and craft, but in the spiral of our appreciation, our instinctive appreciation, I would say, of what a well-made thing is. I think of watches, for instance. I gave up wearing a watch about 15 years ago when I got my phone, and now my phone operates as a watch far more efficiently than any watch could. But my son uh, won't carry a phone and is obsessed with good watches, with mechanical watches, because they represent a standard of uh, well-made time that he thinks is worth mortgaging a bit of your uh, life for. And gen another gentleman <laughs> agrees here. But that seems to me a perfect example. There is no reason why we need to perpetuate the craft of watchmaking. Yes. And just <laughs> no obvious reason, let me say that way. No non-aesthetic non reason. And yet, one of the real generational changes is that those of us of a certain age um, threw our, put our watches away in the drawers, and those of the next generation have not only taken out our watches, but are pursuing uh, the art of watchmaking, appreciating it, making it part of their, literally part of the time of their lives. I say all this simply to say that this is a stakesy conversation, and that these spirals of generation between what is too crafty to be art and what is too arty to be craft are one of the most reliable rhythms of modern life. Do you want to stay there or do you want to come to the podium? I'm happy to stay. Okay. Russian uh, accompaniment. Okay. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Okay. Um, so I will shamelessly read my comments. <laughs> um, so in my comments on lecture one, I argued that, unlike Rachel, who thinks that it's criterial for being a craft at all, that the craft produced some objective and disinterested good that contributes to the common good, Plato thinks that to be a craft requires, more minimally, just a unified object. That may be a purely theoretical subject matter to be investigated as in the mathematical sciences, or a unified product, like health or shoes produced by medicine or the shoemaker. I used a difference that Plato's Gorgias draws between craft and knack, for example, medicine and cookery, to bring out this point, that knacks can't be crafts 
because what they produce isn't one thing, not because it isn't a good thing. Plato thinks, furthermore, that a gnat can become a subcraft by being subordinated to something that does give it a unified end, as when the doctor enlists the chef to make healthy food tasty. But again, this is dependent on unity rather than goodness event. The objective goodness of a craft, I think, is not given by the craft itself, but by its role in producing the common good. And the common good is the object of one particular craft, the superordinate craft of politics, on Plato's view. My claims were about the interpretation of Plato in lecture one, and they will be in lecture two, on lecture two also. Um, but I also thought that Plato, as I interpreted him, would be helpful to Rachel, since her contribution to the common good requirement threatens to collapse all the crafts into one, whereas what she articulates so beautifully is the distinctiveness and autonomy and motivational insulation of the different crafts. Before I turn to the themes of Rachel's second lecture, I want to spell out how Rachel's star platonic text, Republic I, is consistent with the picture that I've offered, because I think that Rachel reads it as committing Plato to making contribution to the common good criterial for being a craft, and I think that this is a mistake, mistaken reading of Republic I. So in Republic I, Socrates rejects Thrasymachus's definition of justice as the advantage of the stronger. And then there are other examples, like shepherding is the advantage of the shepherd, and so on. Now, in addition to making the logical point that the kinds of knowledge being non-deficient don't benefit the craft practitioner qua craftsman, Socrates actually questions whether Thrasymachus's definition is of the right form. So he says to the... Um, definition that Thrasymachus has proposed, that justice is the advantage of the stronger, he says, you also answer, Thrasymachus, that the just is the advantageous, even though you forbade me, as he had done earlier, to answer this, but you add to this of the stronger. I don't know about that, he says a little later, but we should examine it. So the definition of a craft should state its object, the thing that the craft is set over in Plato's terminology. Can it also include its user or its beneficiary? I think that there's an analogy to be drawn here between the Kantian emphasis on the universal form of law. Because we know that law is universal in form, we immediately think there's something fishy, something <laughs> ill-formed about a law that mentions an individual. I think Plato is making the point that craft, including productive craft, is impersonal in form. It should not mention users or beneficiaries. We need to be careful here, though, because a craft object may be the improved condition of an already existing object. And the already existing object is, in that case, obviously a beneficiary. For example, medicine restores health to the sick body. And in that respect, clearly the sick body is benefiting. It's becoming healthy again. Nevertheless, it's sick bodies that are the beneficiaries of medicine, not tall bodies, except as Aristotle would say, accidentally. That's to say, it may be that the doctor heals the tall person, but it's not in virtue of the tall person's being tall that he's healed by medicine. It's in virtue of his being sick and so receptive to medicine's healing powers. And likewise, if medicine turns out to benefit the doctor or the doctor's family or non-patients who say have less caregiving to do because of the improved health of the patient, that is all accidental to the craft of medicine. But I don't think that this point is best made by contrasting a selfish conception with a conception of every craft is aimed at some common good. For that also mentions beneficiaries, but now the beneficiary is the commons. Um, but it's not mentioning the beneficiary in the craft-specific way that the beneficiary of medicine is the sick body. The common good would be why we practice medicine or why we institute medicine in our city. It's not what medicine aims at at its internal end, where the language of internal is also Rachel's. It's not the formal single telos by which all of the practices of the doctor are unified. The craft that has the common good as its telos or internal object is, as I mentioned above, the craft of politics. And politics is what determines whether and to what extent to use medicine to heal and when not. 
It determines whether the city admits the crafts of piracy or retailing or not. And that's as it should be. Whether something contributes to the common good is surely a variable and contingent matter. Distinguishing the craft of politics and its end from the other crafts, as I've tried to do, enables us to distinguish bad crafts, crafts that produce things that are bad for us, from some um, superordinate perspective, they're bad for us. It just distinguishes um, bad crafts from knacks. Knacks are activities that aren't crafts at all because of the disunified nature of what they were trying to produce. And I think this is in conflict with, direct conflict with the slippery slope view on which Rachel and Chris Korsgaard were in agreement yesterday. But I'm gonna set that aside for now. A final point about Republic One. Um, Socrates distinguishes the crafts of shepherding and medicine on the one hand and wage earning on it as its own craft. It's misthotike techne on the other. In a footnote in her paper, Rachel says, Socrates calls wage earning a craft, but he shouldn't. But her reason, I think, is that the craft of wage earning benefits its practitioner, its selfish, rather than producing something for the common good. But I think this involves a slide between the product of the craft of wage making, which is just wages. Maybe a better translation would be profit or recompense. Um, it's sliding between that and um, the reason people take up wage earning, which is of course to benefit themselves. Um, so wage earning does benefit its practitioners, but not qua practitioners of wage earning. It's qua consumers of the products of other crafts that they benefit from the craft of wage earning. But again, that's <laughs> accidental to wage earning as a craft. Um, this is just like being ruled by worse people um, than themselves if they didn't rule is a benefit that philosophers gain by ruling in the ideal city. But we wouldn't therefore conclude that ruling isn't a craft. It's just that practicing the craft of ruling benefits the philosophers accidentally. Okay. Um, Presumably, last sort of thought about this, is that in the ideal city of the Republic, um, nobody needs to practice the craft of wage earning because the city's administration assigns recompense to the different craft producers. So everybody gets to do just one job, um, practice their own craft. Okay, so I began, I'm gonna now turn finally to the second, um, to, centrally to the second lecture. <coughs> I began my comments on the first lecture with the myth of Cronus, claiming that Plato values craft as deficiency remedying, a contingent solution to human insufficiencies when the gods no longer tend to our every need. So that's to say, weaving is only valuable because humans aren't furry or blubbery and the gods no longer clothe us. Medicine is only valuable because our body's balance of humors isn't stable and the gods can't heal us directly, so on. In her second lecture, Rachel said that the age of Cronus isn't an ideal at all for Plato and she likened it to um, the utopia of ease in Bruegel's painting of the land of cocaine where men crash out under sausage growing trees. Now Rachel is entitled to her own utopia but not to her own Plato. Here is Plato in the voice of the visitor, who is the main speaker in the myth of the, the in the statesman. This, is, this concludes the account of the myth of the statesman um, of the age of Kronos. Um, the visitor uh, asks, he says, what you are hearing about is the life of those who lived in the time of Kronos. As for this one, our life now, which they say is in the time of Zeus, you are familiar with it from personal experience. Would you be able to, and willing to judge which of the two is the more fortunate? And then his conversation partner, the young Socrates, says he's not able to judge, and so the visitor answers himself. He says, if with so much leisure available to them and so much opportunity to get together in conversation, not only with human beings, but also with animals, if the nurslings of Cronus used all these advantages to do philosophy, 
talking both with animals and with each other, and inquiring from all sorts of creatures whether any of them had some capacity of its own that enabled it to see better in some way than the rest with respect to the gathering of wisdom, the judgment is easy. That those who lived then were far, far more fortunate than those who live now. But if they spent their time gorging themselves with food and drink, like in the land of cocaine, and uh, exchanging stories with each other and with the animals of the sort that even now we're told about them, this too, if I may reveal how it seems to me at least, is a matter that is easily judged. So that's a very long passage, but the point is very clear. Happiness is not found in a utopia of ease, of course, but in what one does with one's leisure when one doesn't have to work. And this brings me finally to my disagreement about the utopia of work in Plato. I don't believe that there is such a utopia in Plato because I don't think he subscribes to the view of self-realization through work that Rachel described in her second lecture. Instead, Plato sharply separates the ergon or function or civic job that the city extracts from each citizen and which in a well-run city will in fact contribute to the common good from the benefit to each citizen which is provided by a well-run city harmonizing citizens with each other and contributing to their education in virtue. Here's some evidence that um, Plato sees work as burden in the Republic. He says that doing the work of ruling is something that philosophers would rather avoid. When it comes to the productive crafts, he says that craftsmen's souls are cramped and spoiled by the manual nature of their work. And he says that the reason such people as the manual craftsmen are despised is that the best part of their soul, their reasoning capacity, must serve and flatter the lower parts. For Plato, in other words, work is a burden. Rachel says it's fair to attribute the ideal of self-realization through work to both Plato and the Republic and Aristotle, but the two are really very different. For Aristotle, the human function is activity based on virtue. For Plato, it's just virtue. Aristotle grumbles that on Plato's view, someone could be happy because their soul is in a good condition without ever acting on this goodness, for example, if they spent their life asleep. And he takes this to be a reductio of the view that happiness is virtue. That's Plato's view. I suspect that Plato would not concede that one could be virtuous without acting on virtue because acting on virtue is also what maintains virtue. The self-realization through work theorists, I think, can claim Aristotle as their forefather, although I'm sure that Aristotle would be quite discriminating about the kinds of work for many a utopia of work, but I don't think they can claim Plato. For Plato, the final good of, of happiness is a certain condition of soul. Intellect in contact with truth, passion and appetite as supportive of this condition of intellect as possible. That's why the city aims to benefit its citizens by educating them, not by putting them to work. So I would bet that unlike W.H. Auden and Bradley and the many other authorities invoked in Rachel's lectures, Plato would not shed a tear for the end in the sense of disappearance of many, many crafts due to mechanization and automation. And he would be unmoved by the consideration that their disappearance removes some opportunities for humans to exercise their crafty problem-solving abilities. So I think he's quite, he would be quite unsentimental about the crafts. But as I also mentioned in my response to lecture one, Plato also thinks about the crafts in terms of their knowledge component. In the Philebus, he ranks the crafts qua knowledge in terms of their precision and certainty and truth, in terms of their purity, that is, um, or their non-admixture with ignorance. This ranking in terms of purity, he says, is different from a ranking in terms of the craft's utility or nobility or grandeur. So the pure mathematical sciences are more precise than their applied to production counterparts. Geometry is more precise than carpentry, even though the carpenter's craft obviously ranks higher in utility. So the ca carpenter's rougher measurement of straight can produce a shelf on which you can stack your books. Um, the geometer's straight line is no good for that. But the geometer's straight line is better to think with about lines and plane figures and solids, stationary and in motion. I think Plato gives us a way to think about the value of craft activities, not in terms of their social contribution mediated through production, but also in terms of what they do for the mind of the craftsman. 
My comments have focused on the interpretation of Plato, not only because Plato's scholarship is my craft, but also because I think that Plato's perspective is especially relevant today, when we need to be asking what we should do with our leisure, rather than just be in crisis about the unemployment generated by automated provision of our needs, we are encouraged by reading Plato to think about how unemployed human beings might best be employed in the sense of how we might best spend our time. Automation is bringing us closer to an age of Cronus. And Plato's thought is that whether this is a blessing or a curse depends on what we do with our leisure. Will we spend our time on esports and gourmet cooking or talking to each other and the other animals in the pursuit of understanding? Okay, um, I hadn't planned to talk about this, uh, but after yesterday's discussion, I wanted to say a quick word about the relationship between art and craft. I am sympathetic to Alexander's claim that great works of art and philosophy are different from each other, are in certain ways unpredictable, that what makes them great is different from each other, and all of these things make them unlike the products of craft. On the other hand, I think we shouldn't ignore the fact that both subjects are usually practiced in genres. Little known artists from the past are sometimes known only as from the studio of X, where X is some more important or well-known artist, and it's as if the studio were a guild into which he'd been entered. I say this because, I, in my view, I think learning to paint or to write philosophy in a certain genre is a lot like learning a craft. But then when someone produces an unusually resplendent example of the genre or finds unexpected ways of, so to speak, using the genre, making something new of it, uh, then great works emerge. I had an art history teacher when I was young um, who told us that if you want to understand greatness in art, it's important to look at a lot of bad and mediocre instances as well as the great ones. Before she showed us Michelangelo's and Donatello's Davids, she made us look at a bunch of the kinds of statues of dead soldiers with their weapons that you often see in American city parks. It's like, here's how you're usually given the dead hero with his weapon, now take a look at these. And when you visit the churches of Rome, you see hundreds of paintings of Madonna with her child or Jesus on the cross, or this or that saint undergoing their characteristic tortures. And I think they're pretty good to look at, but still the next time you see a Giotto or a Bellini, you're knocked off your feet. If you'd been worried uh, before that perhaps you only like these artists because you were told to, you're not worried anymore. You can see it, you know you can. And I think it's the same with the movies. You might see a whole bunch of nearly indistinguishable Westerns really just as alike as the shoes that Alexander talked about yesterday. And then you see the man who shot Liberty Valance with both exemplifies and comments on the genre, and you see why it's so good. And I think it's often the same way with philosophy. So even if philosophy and art aren't crafts, um, I think at least often they emerge from something very much like craft, which is the routine practice of a genre. Okay, that's what I had to say about that. Now, uh, the next question I want to discuss today concerns bad crafts. Rachel claims that bad crafts are not normative, even for those who believe that they should be practicing them. Uh, she says, and I'm quoting, it's worth thinking a bit more about the cases where bindingness fails, the pickpocket, the mafioso, or your own favorite candidate for bad craft status, According to Plato, these won't be real crafts uh, since their end doesn't contribute to the common good, uh, but they have much of the social and epistemic and even normative profile of a craft. We all know from the movies what actions are prescribed for the mafioso and what makes him good at, at his job. Now, in illustration of that point, she offered us two parallel arguments. Uh, in the first argument, we reason from the fact 
that Lila is a shoemaker to the conclusion that she ought to make good shoes. And in the second parallel argument, we reason from the fact that Alberto is a mafioso to the conclusion that he ought to murder when the Don commands it. Rachel thinks the reasoning on the Alberto side of that picture is false and not just because it prescribes murder at the Don's command. Alberto, she said, would not be obliged to deliver flowers to the Don's mother if ordered to either. And her reason is just that she thinks the identity mafioso doesn't obligate us. Now, I don't agree with that, uh, as readers of the sources of normativity may recall. I got into a lot of trouble over this. Uh, one problem is that we, if we cannot draw the conclusion that a good mafioso ought to murder or indeed do anything else wrong that is incumbent on mafiosos, then we can't point to that conclusion to explain to Alberto why he shouldn't be a mafioso. We can't tell him to stop being a mafioso so that he won't be obligated to commit murder, uh, since according to Rachel, he won't be obligated to commit murder in any case. In fact, we can't point to anything to explain to Alberto why he shouldn't be a mafioso, since there's nothing wrong that a mafioso is actually obligated to do. Alberto could just as well be a mafioso since the condition in itself is harmless. But there's a more important point here. At the moment we start the argument, Alberto doesn't yet realize that he ought not to be a mafioso or he's not fully decided not to be one. Two things seem to follow. One is that we should talk him out of it. Rachel and I agree about that. He shouldn't be a mafioso. But the more important point springs from the venerable problem of the erring conscience. If you believe that you ought to obey orders and you don't obey orders, then there really is something wrong with you. If Alberto doesn't do what he thinks he ought to do, then he's violated an obligation because we are all obligated to do what we think we ought to do. So while I agree with Rachel that Alberto should give up being a mafioso, I also think that until Alberto does give it up, its requirements are really are binding on him. Now, the next thing I'm gonna say is a bit cryptic because of lack of time, but I believe that obligation, like other normative concepts, has its natural home in the first person perspective of the practical deliberator. It's not part of the natural world. It's part of the way in which a rational creature necessarily sees that world. And it exists in the first person perspective, even if there's a sense in which it shouldn't be there. That's a way of saying that obligation is a psychological reality, not just a concept that philosophers use to describe a person's normative condition. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about today uh, is what the theory of agency I told you about yesterday has to say about what Rachel calls the Poisoner problem. The Poisoner problem arises from the fact that the medical knowledge that characterizes the doctor not only enables him to produce health, but also makes him an expert poisoner. Rachel describes the resulting problem this way. This was in lecture one, and I'm quoting now. The poisoner problem represents the biggest obstacle for many recent interpreters and philosophers, a decisive one to the ancient craft model. On that model, virtue really virtue is either is a craft or something very like one. For the virtuous person, like the craftsperson, is always intelligently selecting the right thing to do. The difficulty is we think that virtue motivates overridingly. The just person is one who always does the just thing, but the end of craft does not, as the possibility of the poisoning doctor shows. So there seems to be a profound motivational disanalogy between the two. It's the end of the quote. So if you have a craft, you have knowledge that can be used for opposite ends, but virtue is not supposed to be like that. Now I'm going to talk about how on the theory of activity I told you about last time, we can keep the analogy without the unwanted conclusion that the virtuous person is especially good at vice. Yesterday I talked about teleological activity activity that derives its constitutive standards from those of the product it's trying to produce. 
But not all activities are teleological in the sense of trying to produce something that can be described independently of the activity itself. Some activities are simply supposed to realize certain attributes or values. We might take dancing to be an activity like that. We cannot describe it as having an independent product, even in the rather small sense that the actor's representation of a role is an independent product. The dance is just supposed to be a way of moving that exemplifies a certain kind of grace and athleticism, usually within some particular genre. The theory of activity that I described to you yesterday implies that if you're not at least trying to move in a way that exemplifies grace and athleticism, you're not dancing at all. So trying to dance is trying to dance well. Now notice that in this case, there's no alternative way to describe the activity the way I did when I described the dishonest builder as a moneymaker trying to build something that will fetch him the price of a house. I mean, of course, we could re-describe the bad dancer's movements, and we would if we wanted to be critical. We might say he's just stumbling around. But we can't plausibly re-describe that as what the bad dancer is really trying to do, the way I think we can plausibly re-describe the dishonest builder as just trying to make money. Okay, now I want you to think about another activity that I think is like that. This activity is acting itself. And now I mean acting in the fundamental, not the thespian sense. I mean engaging in activity. What are the constituents, the constitutive standards of acting? Well, I'm going to start by sketching the Kantian account. When someone acts, his movements are determined by his own mind, by his thought and perception. That's true of not even of non-human animals. We don't describe animals as acting unless their movements are determined by the way they perceive the world. The second feature of action is that it's intended to be effective, to produce some object or state of affairs in the world. The result may just be some deliberate movement of the agent's own body, or it may be some sort of product as in teleological action, but there's something in the world the agent is trying to affect. Uh, so that means that a person who acts is trying to do two things. She's trying to produce some effect in the world, and she's trying to make it the case that she is the one who produces that effect. A Kantian way of putting that is to say that in order to act, you have to be autonomous and effective. Kant thought that being autonomous, by what she meant, adopting a law that determines your own conduct, is a rational being's way of being governed by his own mind. Readers of Kant will know that to be autonomous and effective is to be governed by the two principles of practical reason, the categorical and hypothetical imperatives. So those are the constitutive standards of practically rational action. Now, I think that on this conception, being an agent is like dancing. It's an attempt to exemplify certain properties or values in particular, autonomy and effectiveness. And as in the case of dancing, there's no plausible redescription of what you're really trying to do if you fail. If you're trying to do anything, then necessarily you are trying to act. So in this case, if you fail, you just fail. So if trying to act is the same thing as trying to be autonomous and effective, then trying to act is the same thing as trying to act well because those are what it comes to to act well. Now, the account of agency I've just described is, of course, controversial, not least because Kant thought that to be autonomous is to act on a law that you can will for everyone to follow, and that to do that is to act morally. But if he's right, this, prob this theory offers us a solution to the Poisoner problem. It implies that any attempt to act is essentially, and whether the agent realizes it or not, an attempt to act morally, rightly. You may be able to use the medical knowledge, your knowledge of the body, in two different ways, but there's only one way to use the fundamental power of agency, and that's to do what's right. Because if you succeed in being autonomous, you will do what's right. 
So even if the poisoner, in a sense, succeeds as a doctor, he fails as an agent. And furthermore, our identity as agents, um, unlike our identity as the practice, practitioners of crafts, is not one adopted voluntarily, but one we have by our nature. So the norms of agency are not ones that we can escape. If all action is, as Kant thinks, then, the, then morality involves a kind of knowledge that cannot be used in two different ways. It is simply the knowledge of how to act, and it can be, only be used to do the right thing. Now that was Kant, or sort of, uh, but I think that Plato would make a similar point. Early in Republic I, Socrates takes Polemarchus through a stretch of argument in which he asks Polemarchus when you need the help of someone who practices a certain craft on the explicit assumption that justice is one of the crafts. Polemarchus is made to admit that in matters of health, you need a doctor, and when there's a storm at sea, you need a ship's captain, and in a game of checkers, you need a checker player, and in building a house, you need a builder. But there's no situation in which you only need justice, so justice appears to be useless. Now, I think that what Paul Marcus doesn't see and what Plato wants the reader to see is that justice is a kind of uber craft, a craft that stands behind all of these other crafts simply because all of them involve intelligent action. Justice is the craft of intelligent action itself, again, in the fundamental, not the thespian sense the craft of exercising your power of agency. Now, I'm aware that these ideas raise controversial issues about culpability. In effect, I've just claimed that the moral wrongdoer is at some level a bungler who does the wrong thing from a kind of ignorance. He literally does not know how to act, not just in the sense that we think badly of what he does, but in the sense that his actions are defective, considered simply as actions. By virtue of the fact that he's an agent, he's always shooting at doing the right thing. And since he does the wrong thing, he fails to do what he himself is trying to do. Now, would Plato accept that sort of argument? Well, the view that nobody does the wrong thing on purpose is supposed to be one of the tenets of Socratic intellectualism. And I think we should remember that Plato is the philosopher who taught us that the tyrant supposedly a powerful agent of deliberate evil, really is, unbeknownst to himself, the most helplessly enslaved and miserable person there is. Plato also tells us that the tyrannical soul is, of all the different types of souls, and I'm quoting now, least likely to do what it wants. With Plato, that's what the theory of agency I've been expounding says about the wrongdoer that he doesn't do what he really wants or any way what he really means to do when he does what's wrong. So the theory of agency that I've been advocating here may be controversial, but I think it has some influential friends. Thank you. Alexander, yes, if you could turn on your mic. Uh, um, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Well, I actually... Uh, didn't write anything up <laughs> in honor of, of our uh, journalistic and authorial friend here. Uh, I want to say a few things. Um, I think it's more important to have a discussion than to hear us again, but that's another issue. Um, first, let me just say something about what Chris said regarding bad works of art. I think that is absolutely essential, and I think that's what's really wrong with museums that you see one masterpiece, so to speak, after another, and you don't realize what it is that you're supposed to like. I tried to uh, organize a show of good and bad art at Princeton, and the, you know, the museum did not approve the proposal because they said, the works that we have here are gifts from our alumni. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but in general, you absolutely need to see how difficult it is to actually make a good painting or anything that is good in, in the arts, uh, precisely because there are no rules. In general, you need comparison even more than anything else. Uh, the one show that I saw in New York that people actually spoke during 
was a show of Pizarro and uh, uh, Cezanne. Uh, so people saw those two pa the paintings by those two painters when they were sitting next to each other painting the same scene, and they were seeing the differences. And they realized how important it is that the painter actually interprets uh, what they are doing. And comparison is absolutely essential. So I just wanted to su support with great enthusiasm what Chris said about that. Now, uh, as I said, I haven't presented, uh, prepared anything, and since this is Lord Byron's 200th anniversary, I will quote Don Juan, uh, I have nothing planned except perhaps to be a moment merry. I would uh, believe that more if I had more faith in myself and what I'm going to say, uh, and I certainly don't expect you to be merry because of what I do, but there it is. The words that came to my mind uh, this morning when I was thinking about this were voluntary servitude. It's the title of a book that Etienne de la Boissy, Montaigne's great friend, wrote, and the idea is of voluntarily putting yourself in by in a binding situation. And it seems to me that this is very much how Rachel has thought, and following Chris, too, uh, about the uh, submission to craft. Now, I think this idea of voluntary servitude is very, very important, and it has some implications for uh, at least two, maybe three of the characters uh, that uh, whom um, uh, Rachel discusses. The first one is Alberto de Mafioso, I'll come back to him, and I will repeat something that I said very quickly yesterday. It seems to me that what's the reason that he's not obligated, or whatever you want to say, uh, in connection with the mafia is not so much that, it's a pseudo, that maf being a mafioso is a pseudo-craft. In fact, the rules of being a mafioso are much more uh, rigorous and explicit, I think, than in many, many other crafts. Um, what, what is wrong with it is that he is forced into it. He doesn't want to be one. Whereas Henry Hill always wanted to be one, and when he becomes one, he is, feels perfectly obligated to do what he's told to do, and I don't know that he is wrong to feel that way. And we were talking about it last night. Another very good instance of that is uh, the movie, uh, the film Donnie Brasco where uh, uh, Pacino, Al Pacino, the character of Al Pacino, takes in uh, the uh, Johnny Depp right, character. And at the end, it turns out that Johnny Depp is, of course, uh, uh, an informant who's working for the FBI. Pacino finds out, finally, the mafia finds out. And they ask him to come over one night. And he knows that he's going to be killed. And he takes, as you pointed out, he takes his uh, cufflinks out and puts them down and leaves everything there and leaves to go get killed. That seems to me to be almost admirable in its own way, that he actually submits himself to and follows his decision to submit himself to its logical conclusion, or if not its logical, its biological uh, conclusion. <laughs> uh, so I think it's very important that one chooses the craft or whatever it is that they do. And I think the same thing applies to Alberto now as a biscotti maker uh, in the following way. Um, Alberto does not want to be a biscotti maker. He'd just much rather be a philosopher. Um, and uh, what I think Rachel says, I think what she believes is that, in fact, after five years of doing that, he being a biscotti, a biscotti maker is his practical identity. But a practical identity, by Chris's account and the, the account that uh, uh, Rachel cites when she introduces the notion, is one, a description under which you value yourself and that what you do is valuable and important to you. But that's not, imp that's not valuable to, uh, to Alberto. However, he can continue making biscotti, it seems to me, because he has obligations to his family, say. Uh, but that doesn't therefore become his practical identity. And uh, an actual person now, I'm not talking about a fictional character in Berkeley, uh, was asked what he does, and I think he answered something to the effect, I repair string instruments, but I'm a carpenter for a living. And I want to think about the distinction here. Uh, just, I'm just raising it to make a distinction. The same thing with waiters who are really actors. Now, if 
if you're a waiter and you, you look for acting jobs and you don't get one after 20 years, and you say, uh, I am an actor, uh, but I wait for a living, then I think you are deceiving yourself. Uh, but there is, for a while at least, you can identify with the acting part of your life, whether you're actually managing to practice it or not, and that's how you value yourself. But you're doing something else, and you're doing it well. I mean, you can, some actors are very good waiters, uh, and yet, then that's not what they think of themselves as. Not, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say that. That's not that they value themselves as. So I think there is a distinction to be made here. And since we're talking about voluntary servitude, let me talk about uh, Stevens, the butler. Um, I do not think that uh, service is servile. Um, there's something wrong with Stevens. Uh, he identifies his wishes in a very serious way with the wishes of Lord Darlington, his employer. Uh, he does not separate the fact that the, the fact that his job or profession, as he puts it, is being a butler from the rest of his life. He submits altogether, he submits his personality to the uh, desires of uh, the Lord and refuses to see the problems and the imperfections of Lord Darlington. It's, in other words, he may well be servile, but being a butler or a waiter or a maid or whatever, not necessarily servile at all, because there it's not just giving satisfaction. You remember uh, uh, Rachel says that you know, giving satisfaction is not really a good way to live or something like that. Uh, you're not just giving satisfaction. You're giving sort of food satisfaction if you're a waiter. You're giving cleanliness satisfaction if you're cleaning a house and so on. And the rest of what the people who you are serving are is irrelevant to you. That is what um, you know, um, we call an, an, an impersonal relationship where you're only dealing with a particular aspect of a person and the rest of that person is not really relevant to your relationship at all. Uh, as opposed to a personal relationship, like a love relationship or a friend relationship. If, if you have a professional relationship, you're fungible. You're like a mason jar. Anyone can do the job. Anyone who can do the job as well as you can take your place. If you are in the arts, so to speak, or if you're a friend or a loved one, then no one else can take your place. That's a major difference. And again, that seems to me to be a, a, a fact, a, a feature that differentiates a lot of art from a lot of craft. Um, there, is, there is a difference, even though I agree with Chris that you know, th there is a craft to philosophy. I'm not sure I would describe a genre necessarily as a craft. That's a very interesting issue, actually. What exactly does constitute a genre? Uh, science fiction, we say, and whodunits are genres, whereas a novel is what? It's a genre as well. <laughs> uh, the question is, wh why is it that you don't think of writing a novel as be writing in a genre, whereas uh, writing a whodunit is? Perhaps because there are more explicit rules in what a whodunit has to follow than a novel in general has to follow. So I think genre and craft do have some connections, but I wouldn't identify the two. I would also disagree with, with uh, uh, Adam on this, actually. I don't know that I would describe what Manet saw in academic painting as craft. I think he saw it as formulaic. He saw it as boring, as it's been done already. But that's, I think, not quite enough to consider something a craft, because my sense of a craft is the second sense that you used more than the first, that it does involve a kind of normativity. It does involve doing things well. And when Manet looks at Bouguereau or uh, you know, whatever, he, he sees something that he hates. <laughs> in a way, that's exactly what he doesn't want to do. And you're absolutely right. Uh, you write in your, in your book, and here I will read. Uh, you write, there can never be a science of stories, since exactly what makes each story matter is its difference from the story just heard before, nor any art without history. We are all trying to figure out the trick. Having figured it out, a new trick emerges. That is not what happens with craft. It sometimes does, 
but it doesn't need to. In the art, that figuring out a trick and doing something else is absolutely essential. And I will end there, and I hope that uh, we have enough time for your questions and views. Thank you. We're actually in beautiful shape for questions, which gives us time for a break right now. Um, so we'll hit the platonic ideal of a seven minute break. <laughs> See you in seven minutes. And uh, I should have mentioned before, there will be a reception after uh, uh, at the end of our, our discussions. Um, and uh, these doors will magically open and food will appear. And uh, so please uh, look forward to that as well. Okay, see you in seven minutes. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Rachel Barney back to the up to the podium, and she is going to um, uh, respond to these wonderful responses. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to control myself here and not respond to all those um, wonderfully rich uh, comments. Um, I'm just going to uh, actually flag two disagreements, just in case you're wondering um, what I was disagreeing with the most um, as uh, all these uh, ideas were pouring forth. Um, these are, are two points on which I want to sort of stand my ground, and um, then I will be um, wonderfully silent about everything else and let you do the talking, because that's, that's overdue at this point. Um, so one of the disagreements is with Chris Korsgaard, and I'm uh, alarmed to see also Alexander Neamas uh, ganging up on me on behalf of the mafia, uh, <laughs> these two. Um, I am not prepared to say that um, Alberto is obligated qua mafioso. Uh, and I, I take the point that I introduced kind of too clever a case there because I wanted to tell you all about this Italian movie uh, with a non-standard mafioso in it. Um, but sure, let's take Henry Hill or whoever, someone who's really voluntarily made it a part of his identity and has every kind of commitment you could imagine. Um, I still don't think there's a moral obligation there. Um, or even a submoral one of the kind that we were um, looking at. I mean, there's, a, there's sort of two issues here. There's a substantive point, I think, about um, moral psychology and what uh, the normative case looks like. Um, and I'm sympathetic to Korsgaard's point that um, we are obligated to do what we think we ought to do. That sounds right, doesn't it? Um, we should follow our conscience. Um, but of course, uh, the world is an unhappy place, and we can have conflicting obligations sometimes, um, some of which we know about and some of which we don't. Um, so to me, that doesn't settle uh, the question of whether, um, uh, of what Alberto should actually do. Um, so there are these substantive questions of moral psychology, and then there's a sort of puzzle about uh, identity um, that uh, has a grip on me that I'm, I'm trying to sort out. I, published a paper um, last year on qua, and um, I'm kind of obsessed with qualification right now and go around qualifying everything. Um, but there are puzzles there that I'm not um, sure how to solve, and I do think there is something um, relevant here about the logic of qua and about the way um, moral concepts and normative concepts um, are not, don't transfer across, across different qualifications or the lack thereof. Um, so if Alberto is good qua mafioso, it does not follow that Alberto is good qua human being, right? That's um, a point we all accept. Now suppose that we sort of accept Alberto is um, obligated qua mafioso. Um, I, think, I think that's actually kind of semantically indeterminate in, in some weird way or metaphysically indeterminate. Um, because if you say, um, I mean, that looks like an instantiation of some general principle. Um, but I'm not sure the thing that looks like a general principle really is one. I think it's a kind of generic, the mafioso does this. And you can't immediately instantiate those and get a deductively correct result. So um, the eucalyptus is a widely dispersed tree, right? You know what that means, right? It's a true statement. It doesn't mean that there's a particular eucalyptus, which is you know, dispersed across several continents, let alone that every eucalyptus is widely dispersed. You can't instantiate. Um, from generics like that. So I think when we think to ourselves that, oh, the mafioso uh, is obligated to do that, that's 
one of these kind of trick generics where the instantiation doesn't follow. Um, and I guess I, I also think there's a more fundamental point about the limits of qualification in moral philosophy, because I think in the end, you know, the bearers of obligations are human beings and maybe other kinds of rational agents, if there are any, other members of moral communities, if there are any. Um, but uh, I don't really think that Alberto qua mafioso is the right kind of entity to be the bearer of an obligation. It's got to be the guy. Uh, it's got to be this person. Um, and uh, what I'm denying is that that person, uh, if you like, inherits any obligations from uh, the generic um, mafioso. Um, but I, you know, that's a, a work in progress to try and make the argument for that. Um, and I, I certainly see where the other side of the case is coming from. Um, let me say a bit also about um, Rachna's uh, disagreements uh, with my reading of Plato. Um, I, don't think, I don't think we disagree as much as she seems to think we disagree. Um, I agree with her that Plato is a snob uh, and that this infects some of his comments about um, people who do various kinds of work. Um, I agree that he would not be very moved by worries about mechanization. Um, I agree, actually, that leisure is an extremely important concept for him and for all the, the Greek philosophers. And um, I take that to be compatible with my ideal uh, of a utopia of work. I mean, it's not symmetrical with the utopia of ease, right? It's not that the utopia of work is where you maximize work. Um, that's not what makes it normative. What makes it normative is getting it right. And it could be that, in fact, a utopia of work has to be a leisured society in which, uh, as in William Morris's version of it, it's very sort of emphasized that there's a quasi-voluntary uh, element to the work that gets done because a certain level of, of material um, affluence and leisure has been attained. So I think there's all kinds of interesting questions there to be addressed, but I think maybe um, the term work was being made to do more work <laughs> than really worked um, in um, some of... Uh, some of our apparent disagreements. Uh, I do disagree about uh, the age of uh, Kronos, and I think this is, this is kind of significant for talking about utopias, so I want to go over it again. So this is the passage uh, Rachna uh, read out, which I take to be a passage in which it's made clear that this vision of the golden age is not a normative, not a genuinely normative one for Plato. It is a bit um, tricky because, as you can see, uh, what happens is a question is posed. Uh, there's a pair of alternatives um, which are treated as open. And here's the pair of alternatives, uh, different ways that the, the ancient golden age of Kronos might have played out. Uh, one possibility is that these quasi-human ancestors uh, lived, uh, used their leisure to do philosophy with animals. Uh, so having philosophical discussions with different animal species. That's the good possibility. Uh, that really would make those people more fortunate than us because they could have gained wisdom from all the talking animals. The other possibility is the not so good possibility, and that's the one that's uh, Bruegel-esque. Um, if they spent their time gorging themselves with food and drink and exchanging stories with each other and with the animals, again, of the sort that we even now are told about them. So this is... Um, uh, this is apparently what the stories indicate is possibility number two. Uh, our evidence, such as it is, is uh, said to be supporting possibility number two. That's what the stories say. Well, in that case, it's thumbs down on the age of Kronos. Uh, we know what that looks like from, from Bruegel. Now, so two points here. First of all, um, uh, he thinks the probable case is the bad one. He thinks actually that, uh, and there's some important points here about the possible misuse of leisure, um, you know, without, um, well, okay, I'm not going to finish that sentence, but uh, all kinds of philosophical complexities, um, which might seem to make possibility to seem more plausible. And also, let's go back to possibility number one for a moment. Um, doing philosophy with the animals? What's going on there? I mean, I hate, it's, I think it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thought, but for Plato, it's also a comic thought. He does not think that other animal species have philosophical wisdom. You know, I hate, hate I wouldn't want you to go read Plato hoping to find out more about this idea because it's a joke. Um, it's, it's there to undermine, I take it, the very idea of this golden age by introducing a note of whimsy. I mean, it's, 
you know, Plato does always does many things at once, and it's beautiful, and it's making a serious philosophical point, but it's also introducing a note of whimsy that tells us, look, I'm, I'm, I'm messing around with the trope of the golden age here. Um, this is not, in fact, uh, what I think a normative human society looks like. That's what I, that's my takeaway from this. Plato um, is not fond of that trope of the golden age, and he always introduces some little twist when he plays with it. Anyway, um, I could go on. We also disagree about um, wage earning, so maybe somebody could ask us about that, yeah. and we could we could talk about it. Um, and I also think there's a. I, I was a bit dizzy at the end when Rashna accused me of um, Aristotelianizing Plato because I that was the vibe I got from her interpretation. <laughs> um, I think that the um, uh, the the her reading is um, tending to push Plato towards the direction of um, sort of valorizing the theoretical life and the life of contemplation um, over the life of activity, including the life of craft work and other kinds of work. And I think that's importantly not Plato's model. The theoretical practical distinction is actually not important uh, to him in the way it is to Aristotle, and he doesn't have that hierarchy. And the great proof of that, so I don't think he values craft merely as deficiency remedying. Um, I think craft activity, you know, that makes things call on and beautiful, and you can't ever have enough beauty. Um, that's not merely compensatory. And the great model for this is um, Plato's god is a craftsman in the Timaeus. We're told that this cosmos around us is a work of craft. And he means that perfectly literally, I think. And his god is a demiurgos, a, a public worker, which is the same word that you could use for a blacksmith or a public health officer. And what's more, um, the demiurgos is said to be nous. He's identified with reason. So this is a claim about the nature of rationality itself. It's in the nature of rationality itself to be teleological, good-oriented, active, not merely theoretical and contemplative. Um, so I think uh, on that note, I just really want to thank all my commentators so much. It's been um, fascinating and illuminating for me, and I appreciate their, their thoughtfulness and their uh, stakesiness, and um, that's true whether they agree with me or not. Thanks so much. So, uh, oh wow, okay, <laughs> give me a minute, um, okay, uh, okay. Uh, um, um, okay. Um, okay. Okay, I've, uh, I've got y'all. Uh, Hannah, you are first. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for the amazing lectures. Thank you to all the commentators. This has just been terrific. Um, Rachel, I wanted to ask you a question about the motivational insulation of the crafts. Uh, and so as I understand the motivational insulation idea, the norms of craft have a motivating role uh, but the, these motivations are insulated from a wider set of motivations like uh, needing to pay the rent. Uh, and I really like the idea of crafts as involving an internal system of norms, which is insulated from wider norms having to do with morality or prudence or all sorts of other things. But what my question concerns is whether the norms of craft have to play a motivating role, and the, uh, whether that is they can govern us without motivating. And to give the question uh, a bit more credibility or a bit more substance, I want to connect it to things that can't, or something that can't says in the critique of judgment, where he's talking about um, techne, uh, so something in the vicinity of craft, and he distinguishes technical propositions from practical propositions. And technical propositions are roughly statements of the norms of craft. And technical propositions for him are associated not with the faculty of reason, uh, and hence not with the faculty of desire, uh, which is what he connects with reason in the third critique, but rather they're connected with the faculty of judgment, 
which is associated with the feeling of pleasure and displeasure. Uh, but the point here is that they don't have to do with desire. And what he says about technical propositions is that they belong to the art of bringing about what one wishes would exist. And what I'm inclined to get out of that idea, uh, which I also think is independently plausible, is that when you're making the shoes, you are guided by the norms for good shoemaking, but those norms themselves don't play a motivational role. What's motivating you is the desire to bring about the shoes, uh, and that, of course, might motivate you because you want to pay the rent, or it might be just because of the beauty of the shoes. Um, you want to bring the shoes into existence, and that's playing a motivating role. But it just seems to me to be... <laughs> it just seems to me uh, there was a cat walking across uh, Chris's, <laughs> Chris's camera. I'll see the animals here. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I mean, I don't know if this is a, a really tiny disagreement uh, or a big disagreement, um, because I don't know how important it is for your picture that the norms of craft motivate. Um, but I, I just wanted to register that disagreement, because you might think they can't guide you unless they motivate, uh, but that doesn't seem right to me. So turn your mic on. Yeah. Right, thanks. Um, yeah, that is an extremely um, interesting question, which I'm going to make maybe less interesting, but more answerable by me by not talking about the Kant <laughs> aspect, <laughs> because I, I don't understand. Um, uh, the critique of judgment. Um, so the question is, how, how, do, um, how do craft norms have to be sort of inserted into the, the motivational makeup of, of the craftsperson? And I didn't see myself as saying anything very determinate about what you might call craft deliberation, what's actually going on in, in the head of the craftsperson in a particular episode. And I do, in, in a longer version, I had a footnote where I do a sort of thought experiment um, inspired by actually one of my favorite uh, craft art lines, which is um, uh, the epitaph of Lucas Cranach uh, on his tombstone. So, you know, one of the great um, painters of his time, but his epitaph is actually Pictor Calerimus, very fast painter. <laughs> so that was, that was, you know, what he wanted to be commemorated for was how fast he could knock those portraits out. Um, so let's suppose that Cranach was totally motivated by money. Maybe, maybe that's the correct, I don't actually know anything about him besides that fact, but you know, would that make a difference? Is, is that a disturbing thought? Um, or is that proof that um, no, you don't have to sort of consciously internalize all these um, appropriate motivations and so on? And I think my answer to that is um, that I actually find, uh, I think I called him imaginary pure greed Cranach. Um, I don't find that a plausible, I don't find that thought experiment plausible. Um, I think that um, if you don't pretty consciously and deliberately internalize craft norms and actually care about making the pot beautiful or something, you're not going to make beautiful pots. I mean, maybe, maybe one or two, maybe you'll be lucky and your taste will converge. You know, maybe, maybe you'll be lucky in your external circumstances, um, but over the whole of a career, um, no, you don't, you don't get to be a great painter without caring about great painting, and I would say the same you too. I would say the same for the coal miner, uh, actually. Um, so I think there does have to be some representation of what I'm thinking of as kind of the, the attitudinal package, um, where I was talking there about you know treating something as a craft. What do we mean by that? I think to practice a craft, well, you do have to internalize that package of attitudes, and that includes the motivational insulation. But that's still very vague, right? Um, and I want to leave it that way. Anybody else on the panel want to take a swing? Or... Okay. Uh, Sarah Stroud, next. Thanks, Christine. Um, Rachel, I was wondering if there was anything more that you... Oh, sorry. Yes, sorry. please oh, hold yes, on. Thanks. For the... um, I was wondering if there was anything more that you wanted to say or whether I could coax you to say more about inmate firefighters. Um, I was so happy that you mentioned them. Oddly enough, I, 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 I think this is perhaps shameful. I'm, I'm quite interested in wildland firefighting uh, and have read a lot about it. And there are very moving stories 
um, about inmate firefighters. Um, so partly this is a question of clarification. You mentioned them only in passing, and I, it, I would be grateful if you would repeat what role they were playing exactly in your argument. But the impression that I got was that you were bringing them up sort of in the opposite way that it would strike me. That is, uh, I got the feeling that you were bringing them up in a very much a, a glass half empty uh, manner. Um, when I would have thought that what's very salient about them is the glass half full aspect, just thinking about self-realization uh, through craft. I think what would have struck me is the degree to which these inmates are able to find that uh, through firefighting, if not in the rest of their lives. Whereas whatever exactly it was that you wanted to say about them, um, it was something, something along sort of the opposite lines that um, you know, because of their oppressive circumstances, they don't even get to count as um, practicing the craft of fire. Anyway, no, so no. if you could clarify, that would be yeah. great. And if you would, would, would wax further on inmate <laughs> firefighters, I would be very pleased. Thank you. Well, um, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll do a little waxing. Um, I mean, firefighting is actually an extremely interesting craft, and um, as it sounds like you know, wildland firefighting has its own norms, which are different from urban structural firefighting. And um, uh, anyway, that's that's probably enough waxing, really. Um, I agree with you about the glass being half full, and what I was trying to say, but I, I just sort of stumbled over the words. I think uh, I wanted that was another reason I wanted to play the Richard Burton clip. Uh, talking about his father, the coal miner, um, because I wanted to say, look, um, lots of craftspeople have been oppressed people, and this isn't just a thing about the past. Uh, you know, look around you. Um, it is still the case. I mean, I, I take it that um, it's not just that the California penal system is, is oppressive in various ways, and one knows uh, that there must be innocent people caught up in it, and. Uh, it's also the fact that uh, they're paid, what, I don't know, 40 cents an hour or something. Um, so they're actually oppressed in their firefighting, I would say. Um, so there's a sense in which um, if you're viewing the, the situation through the lens of sort of oppression, um, uh, the firefighting only makes that situation worse. Um, but I want to say there's multiple facts in the picture which are not reducible to each other. So that when I've said everything I want to say about craft and self-realization and so on, uh, strangely enough, not all the problems of politics have been solved. <laughs> you know, there's just a completely different dimension. Um, and, and at some point they have to intersect, right? I mean, is, again, coal mining is a really interesting case because we don't think we need to do that anymore in most societies. Um, that's, and it's been discarded not only because other ways of getting energy are more efficient, but because coal mining will ultimately kill you. So there's a craft that clearly had a certain nobility to it, a real craft, but also kind of tainted in some way. So uh, I, I just, um, I wanna say all these facts are not reducible to each other, really. I just wanted to insist on the complexity of the situation. Jay Wallace. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks again for uh, for these three days of tremendous discussions. Um, it seemed to me you were kind of sidling up in these lectures to the analogy between craft and virtue, but but then you didn't really kind of take the plunge, uh, or you just skipped over it so quickly that I, I wasn't really able to see how and maybe and maybe this is not your intention, but but how or how or whether we might we might develop that analogy. I mean, it, it does seem to me, for all that you said, uh, it seems actually pretty implausible to think that virtue is itself a craft, that there's a, there's a method that we can teach people that's going to reliably produce correct answers to the question of how to live or whatever. And, uh, and you, weren't, you, you weren't saying that you found that a plausible view in any way. But, but, but you did say something interesting about, uh, about the human work uh, as um, the project of making something of yourself. And you know, you know, you would think that, um, and, and you even described that as somehow grounding, um, you know, the 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 normativity of the 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 specific crafts that one would be engaged in, which I, I thought was really a, uh, a a rich and interesting part of your discussion. But but just to pick up on that, I mean, and to to take a hard but familiar kind of case 
from this. There, there are all kinds of craftspeople in your sense who make something of themselves and are masters of their craft, right? Uh, and this goes back to motivational, you know, um, compartmentalization in some way as well. But I mean, it's the Mario Batali problem or something like that. You know, someone's really good at what he's doing, but he's not a good person maybe, right? And maybe his, his badness as a person, I don't know enough about it. It seemed to affect the restaurant in, in some way or his coworkers, but suppose he was just a, a horrible husband or uh, father or something like that, right? But it seems like that's completely compatible given the plurality of goods with his pursuing something uh, that it does contribute to the human good at a very high level and with immense proficiency in the way that exhibits, uh, you know, your, your, all the hallmarks of, of craft excellence, right? He's not a good person, um, but he's, he's actually um, realizing the human work. He's made something of himself, right? And, uh, and you know, if you, if you want to take a further step to say that you're only really realizing the human work insofar as you make something of yourself in a way that's, uh, you know, compatible with all the good, other goods that human life, I, I mean, I, I, I hope that's true, but I'm having trouble seeing how you get there from, and maybe we, you don't want to get there, but okay. from what, from the materials you've given us so far. You could, I suppose, say that your contribution to the culinary arts is not genuinely a contribution to, to a, a human good, unless it's appropriately sensitive to all of the other goods that bear on human life. But that seems sort of implausible to me. Mario yeah. Batali's cooking, I've eaten at some of his restaurants, was very good. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. That's, that's uh, I think there may be several different questions yeah. in there, actually, <laughs> which, <laughs> none, none of which I have an answer to. Yeah, um, yeah I, I was sort of sidling up to the craft model for virtue. Um, I think it is uh, heuristically useful. Uh, Julia Annis's book, Intelligent Virtue, I think gives you a very nice kind of updating of, um, I, I would say, sort of Aristotle without the weird bits. Um, it's a, it's a livable, <laughs> livable Aristotelianism. Um, and it's remarkable that it's possible to do that, and it's completely centered around um, the craft model, not the side of it that I've been talking about, but um, centering on the idea of learning and the idea that, well, you know, you become a, becoming a good person is something that you learn how to do. Uh, and it's something that society teaches. Um, and actually it's a vision that goes very much back to uh, Plato's Protagoras and the myth of um, Protagoras um, in that dialogue. And I think that is actually the ur, uh, the locus of um, this uh, craft model in, in Greek thought. Um, so I'm very sympathetic to that. I don't think that's the whole of uh, the moral story. And I certainly didn't um, think that I was offering any kind of toolkit for the whole moral story here. And of course, yeah, absolutely possible for someone to be a great craftsperson and a horrible human being. And I take that to be um, something that actually falls out pretty readily from, from the things I was saying. Um, Alvin Noe. Thank you. Um, so one of the one of the things that's just going on in these talks is an attempt to demarcate um, craft in this big tent way, on the one side from philosophy and fine art, um, and I'm very sympathetic to you that philosophy is not in the relevant sense of craft, and to Alexander that fine art is not in the relevant sense of craft. But then there's this other boundary, this demarcation of of craft as distinct from, I'm not quite sure what you you, get, you offered a list at one point, family relationships, um, maybe talking or, or learning, learning your mother language, maybe walking down the street. There's a lot of things that we do that seem to be either not sufficiently demanding or not sufficiently specialized or just very ubiquitous in the culture, that they don't rise to the standard of skill. And this has been bugging me. Um, and so one way that I started to think about the way it was bugging me was actually triggered by something that Adam said in his comments uh, yesterday. And it was when you referred to T. Nguyen's book on games very praisingly. 
Um, Because I really, although I like Thi Nguyen, I really dislike the idea of that book and for the following reason. He's got this kind of utopian conception of games as these freestanding structures of normativity. And then we, we we adopt roles and we experiment with agency and it's this kind of, I don't know, it's this art of agency, it's this beautiful thing about self-experimentation. But I think that loses track of the way games are really embedded in human life. And so just to make the point really in a kind of strong way, think about the way the games show up in the playground. Uh, you know, uh, handball, dodgeball, softball. You don't choose these games. And moreover, in, there's this sort of Lord of the Flies-esque moment when sides are picked up and you're, you know, you're picked last and you're, you're made to play. And if you lose, you're not just you didn't play a role that lost, you lost, and your social status is, there's a lot of, the state, there's a lot of stakes. Games playing is very stakesy. And um, it's thinking about that made me think that I want to say that crafts are very bound up with life and stakesy in that way. This is related to Hannah's question about motivational insulation. Because one interesting thing about if I'm a builder, so I'm, I'm, I'm going on for a while, but I want to get to the crux of this. If I'm a builder, um, and this also pertains to, to the resources that Chris has given us for think, thinking about this, I can't quite always unproblematically take for granted a principle of individuation governing what it is I'm building. Because after all, what I'm trying to do is make a life as a builder. That means I, I need to pay the rent, and I need to make the payroll, and I need to source the building supplies, and I need to deal with the demands, not just of the generic customer, but of all the specific kinds of buildings that there might be, which means, I think, that my task as a builder becomes very particular. It's not quite, I don't just sit there practicing the craft. I have to cope with surviving as a practitioner of the craft. And that's really the craft. So, so there's a very particular, and I, I'm emphasizing the word particular because that's in contrast to this idea of a system of rules and skills of sufficient demandingness. You know, I can teach you how to make shoes but I can't teach you how to have a successful life as a shoemaker, how to run a workshop, how to, how to manage a team, how to educate apprentices, and, and so on and so forth. So where that leads me to then is, if you, if, you, if you follow me down that slope, then I start to think that this, the sharp boundaries between what's inside the craft, what's outside the craft, get, get weaker. Um, and indeed, the celebration of the craft starts to seem sentimental. It starts to seem nostalgic, maybe fantasy. I don't know if there, were ever, if there was ever a time when craftspeople were insulated from reality so that they could just cultivate themselves in, in relation to their crafts. Um, and, then, and then the thought I have is, that opens up another possibility, which is that the kind of values that you're seeing in craft of self-actualization needn't be confined to craft, but maybe they can be confined to that stroll I take on Sunday morning, to the mindfulness and skillfulness with which I find myself present on the street with my family. Or alternatively, the way in which, yes, everybody speaks their mother tongue, but maybe everybody doesn't speak their mother tongue with the same, I don't want to say craftiness, but with the same knowledge, with the same skill, with the same capacity, with the same virtuosity, with the same invention. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Please respond. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yes, yes, is my response. Um, uh, I think there is, I mean, I was being deliberately very schematic, right, um, to try and just get some kind of view on the table. Um, and I'm happy to have that schematicness kind of messed up in, in various ways and, and say, no, no, the, these lines are blurry. And actually, Adam has been doing that by continually pointing out the importance of change and that crafts are dynamic. And I've, I've been giving you this very kind of, um, you know, static um, picture. That's not accurate. There, there's, um, there's a continual evolution by all kinds of weird stepwise um, processes. And you're sort of making the same point that there are these, uh, these blurry edges um, of different kinds, I think. I, I don't think that all the kinds of blurriness you were trying to introduce were the same thing, and I'm more receptive to some than to others. 
Um, one thing I want to find out more about is actually how um, functioning guilds used to work in societies that had them, um, because that's a way of thinking about uh, the normativity of you know, not just making this pot or something, but being a potter as a metier. Um, and there were, you know, we, we have these documents from med medieval Venice that go on about how you're supposed to treat your apprentices and regulating the nature of competition. And um, so I feel like there's there are ways to make that thought more concrete. Um, I would still want to keep my own focus on um, that sort of basic confrontation of the, the craftsperson with the material in that uh, immediate situation. But of course, you're right that that's extremely particular. Um, and I think um, another point you were getting at, that here's, here's how I would put it, um, is if you think about someone um, weaving a great carpet, let's say in, in one of the, the tribal carpet making traditions, and it's going to be some um, woman who's been doing this for decades, and there will be a, a pattern, there will be some kind of schema that she's adopted that's probably traditional, that's um, specifying the problem kind of to be solved. Um, but then in the execution, um, you get, I forget all the terminology, but there's sort of tertiary detail. And the tertiary detail, the craftsperson, she can put in little autobiographical uh, bits of imagery, things that are about her family, sort of uh, secret messages. And um, the dye will be varied by what the plants uh, were like that season. So there's this wonderful thing called abrash, where the, the color of the dye actually modulates because over time, um, the concentration of the floral essence is, has kind of changed with the season. So, you know, no other person could make that carpet in exactly that way. It's completely specific to that individual, and that's part of what the carpet lover appreciates. Uh, it's, it's a part of the art um, which isn't rule-bound, can't be specified, can't be replicated, and I absolutely want to leave room for all that. So, um, so uh, let's see. Um, Andrea, yeah. Okay, thanks so much. These were really stimulating talks and um, great comments. So my question concerns a distinction you drew between um, self-actualization and uh, turning yourself into a tool for the gratification of another person. And so this was in the context of your discussion of the butler. And I was wondering what exactly is sort of objectionable about the butler or how you want to distinguish these two. Um, and I was thinking that one possibility is that what the butler does is too repetitive. And here I was thinking of a certain criticism of housework, maybe Beauvoir's characterization of housework is too repetitive and not allowing for opportunities for self-actualization in the sense of some kind of creative intervention. Um, the, other the other possibility that occurred to me is that it's because you're only serving one person and that's not really the common good. Um, and then I wondered if it was something having to do with the fact that you're that you're sort of investing all of your energies just to serve this one specific individual, whether that's what's objectionable, or that it's something about the inequality of the of the situation or the hierarchy uh, within which you're working. And I was thinking about this also in connection with um, something else you suggested in your talk yesterday um, about motherhood. So I, I wondered what the role of motherhood was in the the utopia of work. And um, on the one hand, you suggested that participation in family relations, that's not really craft on your account, but you did have an image that featured a mother um, in the utopia of work. And I was thinking that it might be interesting to think about that role in relationship to this contrast between self-actualization and turning yourself into a tool for the gratification of another. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, those are, um, those are big. Doesn't anyone have a small question? <laughs> even, even the firefighting one turned out to be big. Um, first of all, it's not, um, Stephen's problem is not that being a butler is, is drudgery. It's not that it's too repetitive or anything like that. And I don't think it's just uh, the aspect of serving one person. Inequality is getting closer to it, I think. Um, I think what, I mean, first of all, I think we're not supposed to have an easy answer to this. There's, there's all these, I think as you read, you're expected to formulate kind of these different hypotheses. And Ishiguro is actually very kind of philosophically sophisticated at just kind of um, knocking each one out from under you once you, once you think you've understood what's, what's going on here. But my, um, and you know, and one thing I find fascinating is it seems to me that actually you could be a great butler. 
Uh, I think that's a defensible craft, but surely the craft of the butler consists in organizing the household and performing all these concrete tasks, which we see Stevens perform with great ability and acumen, but he's the one who insists on identifying greatness in a butler with a kind of self-annihilation. Um, he sort of goes out of his way to self-conceptualize that way. And so that's got to be at the heart of what's gone wrong here with him. Um, the, the self, I was calling it self-instrumentalization, and I think that is meant to seem ugly to us, and it's ugly in Chagru's other works. And I, so I think, for me, that's kind of the dividing line. And there was something, oh, Alexander, you, you pointed out that he's, um, he's sort of excessively deferential to his uh, awful sounding master. Um, and there's a, there's a sort of paradox there, um, which is that he, um, he presents himself as having carefully chosen to work for this particular person out of a kind of aspiration to, you know, he's going to be organizing a peace conference and he's going to make his tiny contribution to making the world a better place. So he's actually very kind of ethically thoughtful and so on. But then when push comes to shove, once he's in the job, he does not consider himself entitled to have opinions anymore about um, some of the political and, and moral mistakes that his master makes. So there's a, I, I really think it's the self-annihilation part of it um, that's gone terribly wrong. And you could, uh, you could have something like that, I think, in lots of different putative crafts which practice differently might be real crafts. Let's, let's through. Yeah. I help Rachel, I'll alleviate the burden of difficulty. Just say two quick things ab uh, about that. First of all, if you think about it, one of the great relationships in all of um, modern literature is between, not between a butler properly so-called, between a valet and his master and that's uh, Jeeves and Bertie in the, in the P.G. Woodhouse stories. And there we're meant to understand that G Jeeves is a wholly self-realized person, even though he's in bondage to his idiot master, Bertie. Yeah. But we're meant to understand that as an act of enormous intellectual gallantry, even of, as a kind Don, of... Don Quixote also. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah, as a kind of saintliness on Jeeves' part, because he's prepared to devote his matchless mind to solving the the meaningless romantic, well not meaningless, but the trivial romantic intrigues of his master. So that I think is, Woodhouse is a better writer I than Cat. <laughs> yes, I think so. Yes, and it's in Woodhouse's commentary on Hegel as well. I think it, it comes up. Um, let, me, let me just quickly respond to Alva's point because I, I, I think it's significant. And that is that what I think is appealing about that account of games is exactly, it helps us ask, answer the question, which is very, looms very large in my life and I suspect in the lives of many, um, why do we care so much about sports, right? I'm, uh, the, I'm obsessed about sports. I stay up all night listening to NFL po podcasts. I, you know, when I'm out here, I go to a Giants game. I live and die with the Montreal Canadiens. And there are people, one of whom I'm very closely related to by marriage, who think that this is just mania and madness, and it has no, there cannot be a philosophical reason for one's attachment to um, sports to that degree. And the, what I like about the answer that Nguyen gives us is that what we're getting from that, we, we try to sentimentalize it. And this, and I'm, I don't want to go too far afield, this has a lot to do with the problem of craft. We sentimentalize our appreciation of sports by saying, oh, we love the balletic grace of um, uh, Michael Jordan, or uh, we admire the courage of Brock Purdy, who is without sufficient talent able to operate at a high level. <laughs> and we, we find all of these sentimental ways of explaining their moral exemplars in sports. And it's not very persuasive, right? Or we, uh, and, but, it, but if we say to ourselves, well, what's fascinating about it is, is there are high level solutions to low level problems, right? The problem of getting a ball, walking a ball 100 yards is not a real problem. That's an easy thing to solve, getting a ball to go 100 yards. But once you, intervene with an incredibly complicated set of constraints on that, you genuinely are engaged in learning something that's, that's significant in, in your life. You're learning about styles of agency. It's why we like reading old playbooks of Bill Walsh's, even though they're out of date, because we say, oh, look how ingenious this is as a, as a form of problem solving. And we learn uh, by, by becoming obsessed with sports, our sense of the possibilities of agency are augmented and increased. I said in the piece I wrote about in The New Yorker, I gave the wicked or uh, inappropriate example of how we always used to say back in the day, um, you know, he got to first base, he got to second base, right? We use the sequential steps of seduction 
We learn them by mapping them on our knowledge of, um, of playing baseball. So that's what I find appealing about it. And I think it has to do with craft in as much as, exactly, it tells us, don't sentimentalize our pleasures. Be honest about what it is the, the degree of artif artifactuality uh, provides us. Sorry. Thanks very much. Uh, Kent Schuckstra. <coughs> So uh, great thanks to all five of you. Those are just wonderful. Uh, you've provided us with a wonderful occasion over these three days. Um, and I'd like to uh, ask one of the commentators a question. In particular, I'll, I'll ask uh, Rachna a, a question, although uh, there are a lot of rich things here. Um, I thought the, your comments were very penetrating ones, and I want to pick up on one thing, which is not what Rachel told us we had to ask, which is about uh, the art of money making, but a different plank of the argument, which is about um, how um, a, the craft of justice has to be defined. And in particular, the idea that the identified problem with um, uh definition of the craft of justice um, is that it's not um, law-like in the Kantian sense because it specifies the beneficiary. Um, so the idea that is that when he says that justice is the advantage of the stronger, that's the problem. Is that, and I, I want to ask you about that because it seems to me that Socrates um, doesn't identify that as the problem. Socrates says that what we need to do is examine the truth of this, and he believes it's untrue. Um, but it doesn't, I, think, I think Socrates accepts that the form of the definition is proper. Um, uh, and sometimes I think with, a, with an interlocutor, um, the interlocutor makes a good point. And I think, uh, and I think Plato intends his uh, readers to think that, Plato, uh, that the interlocutor is making a good point against Socrates. I think this is one of those points. Um, because I think the Thrasymachan objection to definition like um, justice is, is beneficial or justice is good or justice is virtuous um, is that it's, it, it's meaningless, it, it's uninformative. Um, and I think here that it, it's not so much about, well, it's more like Hegel's objection to Kant in terms of there's not enough content in there for it to be action guiding. Um, and so, or informative. And, um, and I think that that's a, that's a good thought um, and that we as readers may be uh, encouraged to take it up. And um, I, I think it's also a good idea from the point of view of the, the crafts because I take it the pediatricians, uh, the pediatrician is supposed to bring about health in children. Uh, even the doctor is supposed to bring about health in human beings as opposed to the veterinarian maker of prosthetics, has a specific set of beneficiaries in mind, and so on. And so I, um, I, I wonder about uh, that plank of your argument, whether you might like to say more about it. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I, that's very, very um, helpful for kind of further, um, helping me further articulate the idea. So when Socrates says justice is advantage, I don't think that's a definition, right? It's a thing that he says, it's a mark of justice, but it's not a definition. He doesn't have a definition. And the, the exchange with him and Thrasymachus at this point is Thrasymachus adds of the stronger. And Socrates says, well, you're just saying the same thing as me, except you're adding of the stronger. And then Thrasymachus says, you think that's insignificant. You think that's a small thing. And Socrates says, well, let's find out, right? So that is. Now, what I think is going wrong there is it's not that it's not wrong for Thrasymachus to try to further specify to give a contentful definition. Totally agreed with that. But the way that he tries to specify it, I think, is logically ill-formed because what he is identifying is, I put it in Aristotelian terms, an accidental feature of the craft of justice. So it is true, I think it is true that justice is the advantage of the stronger, but not in the sense that, that Thrasymachus thinks. And it's also not the way to define justice because it doesn't, it doesn't identify the peculiar product 
of justice. So I would think that um, the identification should be justice is the craft of ruling and its object is that's, that's the craft that has the common good as its, um, as its object. Of course, the ruler benefits from justice, but that's not its tell us. So, so I, I, I think the, the, the interaction between Thrasymachus and Socrates there is um, Thrasymachus is once again, um, he, he has introduced this language of qua, but then he's using it unsystematically. So sometimes he uses it, sometimes he doesn't use it. So qua, uh, expert in justice, you're not benefiting yourself, you're producing the common good. But qua human being, you benefit from being just. Okay, <laughs> that's what I have to say. Thank you. Um, Johan. Thank you. So this is a question primarily for Rachel, but it's very much prompted by some of Alexander's remarks yesterday about the contrast between craft and art. Um, so it seems to me that one salient contrast between craft and art is that in judging whether someone is a great craftsman, we care much more about consistency, or as you put it in your first lecture, uh, reliability, whereas in judging whether someone is a great artist, it's largely a matter of peak performance, what they're capable of doing at their very best. Um, so for example, someone who cannot consistently make a good shoe is not an expert shoemaker. He hasn't truly uh, mastered the craft of making shoes. And that would be true even if on his day, you know, he's capable of making a pretty good shoe. Um, by contrast, I think a writer or a composer who can't consistently create masterpieces can still be a great artist. So to choose one of the arts that I know a little bit about, um, I think there are many composers amongst them some of the very greatest, um, whose output varied really quite considerably in quality, um, um, even when they were at the peak of their powers. So I think Tchaikovsky is an example, Dvorak, uh, some might even say Beethoven. Um, indeed, I'd even go so far as to say that um, when it comes to artists, uh, where there's a sufficient body of really outstanding work, um, it almost doesn't matter uh, what the average is, right? So, Suppose we were to discover that in addition to his 38 plays, uh, Shakespeare had written another 200 plays that were really pretty mediocre. I think that would do absolutely nothing to uh, detract from his status as the greatest playwright of the English language. So first, I'd just be curious um, whether you think this is indeed a salient uh, difference between crafts and arts. But then secondly, this got me thinking about the relevance of this distinction for the connection that you're trying to draw and that Plato is trying to draw between craft and virtue. Um, so it seems to me that there's some moral uh, honorifics that we bestow on people in virtue of what they're capable of on their best day. Uh, so for example, you can become a hero through a few acts of exceptional moral or physical courage, even if the rest of your life was uh, morally quite unremarkable. I think we sometimes call people a prophet for having grasped some really great and important truth, even if a lot of the rest of what they said strikes us as misguided. By contrast, I think, you know, to count as a truly virtuous person, it seems you have to be someone who, if not infallibly, then at least habitually and therefore to some extent reliably thinks or feels or acts virtuously. So my second, and that's really the important question is, do you see this emphasis on reliability and consistency as one reason why the craft analogy for virtue seems so apt? And if yes, could you just say a bit more about that? Because that, that theme didn't get, get its full, uh, it could get as much attention as I think it deserves in, in the lecture. So thank you. Thank you. That, uh... that's, that's super interesting. Um, I'm actually fascinated by courage as a, as a virtue, and that's something that I've written about is this weird fact that in the case of courage, we don't really care about consistency. You know, you get the medal for that one uh, outstanding performance and nobody says, oh, he shouldn't really get a medal. You know, he was 
Um, you know, he's uh, easily bullied by his bank manager or something, right? Um, that's, uh, we don't care about context, cross-contextual or anything. Um, so I think courage is a weird virtue that way. Um, and I'm, um, yeah, I mean, I, the other um, thing that occurred to me about, so this leads in all kinds of directions. Um, the thing about consistency, I think, is important for our concept of craft. And that's so, even if you want to say with Adam Gopnik, and I'm happy with this, you know, that there's, there's craft in art and there's art in craft. It's a yin yang, yeah. everything. Um, but still the crafty bit of whatever craft is, I think does have to do with consistency. And that's because we think the craftsperson has a method and that method has to involve understanding cause and effect, right? They've got to understand causal regularities, whether it's the doctor or the baseball player at, at some maybe less conscious level or something. Um, but understanding causal regularities has got to be a big part of what craft is. And so you, you want to see that displayed in the actions. If the actions are inconsistent, that casts doubt on whether they've really got that. Uh, that grasp and you start to think well maybe they're just lucky you know so pseudo crafts I think often are so a fascinating case would be you know playing the stock market right the stock the the fund manager uh, does the fund manager have techne well notoriously after a few decades most of the fund managers who can make you lots of money will also start to lose you that money um, and at that point you wonder well were they just uh, lucky in some kind of sustainable way um, but not sustainable forever. So I think telling, telling craft from luck is actually really important. That's something I didn't talk about, but that's where the consistency comes in. Whereas if you've written Boris Goodenough, that wasn't luck, <laughs> you know, there's no question about uh, that. Um, and the interesting in-between case, I think, would be um, interpretive artists. So what about the person who plays the musical composition? Um, you know, maybe... Uh, an incredibly beautiful performance of some work for piano, um, you know, maybe a small child on their on their day uh, in a school recital is going to just, you know, um, hit it out of the ballpark or, or whatever metaphor we want. Um, but the fact that they can't do it consistently suggests, mm, no, they're not a great pianist. So we do, I think with the interpretive arts, we do want to apply that standard of, of consistency in a way that we don't with the ones who are creating ex nihilo. So yeah, it just gets more and more complicated. Anybody else? Uh, Alexander or? I agree. Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There uh, made me think of a, isn't it a line perhaps of Aristotle? I think it was quoted by Gadamer that love, uh, that uh, skill loves luck and luck loves skill. Technically loves Taiki. It's a Gadamer quote. Yeah. So it's the opposite. To... <laughs> this is a learned room. <laughs> <laughs> Please. We can we can perfectly make sense of the notion that um, uh, uh, art or skill or techne uh, loves chance because that's come. Alexander put that very well, I think, yesterday. Notion of contingency. But what does it mean to say that chance loves art? So I, I stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, so, uh, you in the green sweater. Don't know your name. Yeah. Savannah. Um, thank you. This actually is a question about what you asked, but not because you asked. Um, <laughs> I was really struck in the first lecture when you said that when practitioners can't find customers, then we have a craft in trouble. Um, so customers engage the craft practitioners by like, treating them as wage earners by paying them but then also by engaging with whatever product they produce. Um, so my question is, why do the practitioners need customers? Um, is it not enough that they're engaged in their craft to be like successful craftspeople? Um, so I wonder if it has something to do with providing the impartial benefit to society and whether other members of society have to recognize it and value it enough to pay for it. Um, you talked about Plato and the shepherds. 
So Plato says that shepherds are only shepherds insofar as they take care of the sheep, but somehow what they're paid for is some other activity that's wage earning. But that wage earning obviously can't be independent of the other activities that they're doing, whether that's a craft or a pseudo craft. Um, so I just want to hear more about the relation between the internal structure of craft and wage earning, which seems somehow external to it, but maybe on your view, like not totally separate. Yeah, thanks. So on, on the platonic view, first of all, I think it's important actually that wage earning isn't really a craft, that, that that's just a, a temporary little maneuver that Socrates makes in Republic I, because it has, it has the wrong formal features. It's, it's reflexive for the agent, um, a wage or a profit that you make only, what is that? That's a sum of money, but what makes it count as a wage is that you're the person acquiring it. Um, and it's also something that uh, that agent is probably trying to maximize, and Plato craft is not a maximizing enterprise. It's one that aims at a correct quantity of something. Um, so if wage earning were to be if wage earning were to be a platonic craft, um, you'd have to be indifferent as to who got the wages. <laughs> it would have to be somehow impersonal and open. You'd just be trying to generate wages um, in as a social fact. Um, and it would have to be aimed at the right wages for everybody, not any kind of economic maximization. So, um, so I think Plato, there's a kind of implicit um, critique of treating um, activities governed by the profit motive as craft. If, they're, if it's really a craft, making money is not the point of it. Um, making money has the wrong kind of shape uh, to itself be a craft, and it's not identical with the end of any other craft. So that's another formal problem with it. There's no particular method for money making, right? Um, you can, it can be epiphenomenal on, on whatever craft you like. Um, so then the question is, what's the relation of the real crafts to this thing, wage earning? Um, and I did want to um, allow something Plato allows, which is um, that it's important for, um, I mean, his vision of the first city in book two of the Republic is you know, you've got a carpenter and a shoemaker and a farmer, and they trade the fruits of their labor. And that's, that's where a, a human community comes from, actually, is that division of labor and interdependence. Um, so if you see the wage as kind of a marker of that in a more complex society with money, um, then that seems to be a marker that the craft is kind of doing its job. Um, things are unfolding as they should. Um, you know, all the characters in busy town are doing their thing and living happily together. Um, but it has to have that kind of, um, I'm, I'm using this language of the marker or the, the symptom or something because it's not what the craft itself is about. Um, so maybe I should leave it at that. I think Rachna has I wanna, a I want to add something to this. So this is something that actually uh, Jeremy Reed sitting over there pointed out to me right before our session today, which is that in the argument in Republic One, it's essential that wage earning is a techne because it's part of the argument for why um, the rulers need to be paid in honors because otherwise they will be practicing to techne, both ruling and wage earning. So it isn't just a throwaway or placeholder. I think, I think that Plato means it very seriously and I think that the apparently ridiculous thing that what wage earning does is simply aim at wages, not at assigning them to someone, is actually the view. It doesn't have to be maximal wages. Um, that's why I was thinking something looser than wages, which kind of builds in the assignment to a person, is what he has in mind. So there's some recompense for what the work put out that is... Um, the product of the craft of wage earning, but it could be that recompense can be um, brought about in a different way than by each um, each craftsman um, performing to crafts. So, for example, in the ideal city, it's not the case that each craftsman has to practice both because society. So, the um, ruling craft or the craft of um, uh, the rulers or justice simply provides the um, recompense. That's my alternative. I, I don't agree with any of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, so um, Alec, uh, is there, Alec, is that your Alec, right? I'm Dave. Oh, sorry, Dave. Okay, I got your name wrong. Okay, my apologies. And this will be the last question. Oh, um, better be good. Well, I was going to ask about self-defeating conditions and uh, terrible knowledge and some some other uh, more technical things. But uh, could you tell us, uh, Professor Barney, about the Argonauts of the Western Pacific, please? Oh, yay. Yeah, this is um, one of the many great things about doing this topic is um, I got to read up, not as much as I would have liked, but I got to read up on a lot of actual crafts. And um, it's uh, a wonderful and, and humbling and enlightening thing uh, to discover all these um, case studies. And I also get to say something that uh, the philosophers in the room will appreciate, which is that I finally found a philosophical use for the works of David Lewis. Uh, who's a, a fa very famous figure in our field whose interests don't really connect with mine very well. Um, but there's another David Lewis um, who, uh, at sort of just the right time, I guess in the 60s and 70s, uh, apprenticed with some of the last of the fully trained Micronesian and Polynesian navigators. And uh, it's one of, I didn't understand most of it, but it's still one of the best books I've ever read. We the Navigators, highly recommended as a kind of pretty internal but also anthropological, explaining it all to the outsider, pretty internal portrait of what it is like to be the kind of person who can sail a thousand miles across the Pacific and find the island that you're looking for. And it's really, um, it's move, it moves me. We the navigators. We the We're navigators, navigators. yeah. Let's give a final round of applause. best audience. Um, my apologies to all those left on the queue, but you'll have a chance now during the reception as these doors and should open magically. <laughs>